Hi, Dr. H here. This video is going to review uh, Unit 2 of the AP Biology course. And this unit is about transport. So we will start with the cellular aspects of transport, uh, cell membrane structure, and how do uh, cells move molecules in and out. And then we'll get into some of the uh, larger organ systems uh, that are involved in transport, both in plants, so we'll talk about water movement and uh, the sugar sap movement. And then we'll talk about uh, moving things around animals. Uh, we'll talk about the circulatory system and uh, moving the dissolved gases around. And we'll talk about uh, osmoregulation, which is controlling the amount of dissolved salts in the uh, bodily fluids. All right, so first off, the cellular aspects of transport. This uh, involves mainly the cell membrane. Uh, that is the organelle that, which is responsible for controlling what gets in and what gets out of the cell. So here we see the structure of the cellular membrane. Um, the main part is the phospholipid bilayer, kind of shown in gray and yellow down there. Um, and, but there are also lots of other parts. Uh, all of the proteins, all of the uh, purple bits there are all these proteins which are either embedded in the membrane uh, or are floating around the surface of the membrane or are uh, completely outside or inside of the membrane, such as the uh, extracellular matrix or the, uh, the cytoskeleton. Along with the uh, regulation of what gets, what gets in and out, the membrane also plays a very important role in uh, cellular recognition. Uh, and that is mainly done by these uh, glycolipids or glycoproteins, these long uh, carbohydrate chains, which are on the outer surface of the membrane. Uh, and these kind of act as cellular name tags. Uh, they give information about, about what type of cell and also whether that cell belongs in the body or not. Uh, one very uh, well-known example of these uh, glycoproteins are the, uh, the blood types, the ABO blood type system. Uh, is determined by uh, some of these uh, glycoproteins. So in terms of structure of the membrane, uh, the main part, uh, the main structural component is the phospholipids. Okay, and these phospholipids um, have a very interesting structure. Uh, they have a head group, which is polar, so that would be hydrophilic or water-loving. And then they have these two fatty acid chains at the bottom, which are nonpolar, uh, so they would be hydrophobic. When these uh, phospholipids are placed in an aqueous solution, they will spontaneously form this uh, bilayer. Okay, and this is a very energetically stable structure with the hydrophobic heads facing out uh, towards the aqueous solution and with the hydrophobic tails on the inside sort of sandwiched away from all the water. And this way, everybody's happy. Okay, the head groups get to interact with the water, which they like and the tails get to stay away from the water, which they also like. So uh, another important concept on the molecular level is uh, the idea of diffusion and osmosis. And diffusion is just simply that the phenomenon of uh, concentrations tending to move towards equilibrium. Okay, when you have an area of high concentration and an area of low concentration, of some solute, that solute will tend to move around in order to kind of equilibrate and get one equal concentration all around. Now, in the case of cellular transport, we put something in the way, something called a selectively permeable membrane, such as a cell membrane. And this will allow some molecules through and some molecules not. Okay? And uh, there's lots of different things which will sort of go into determining whether a molecule can get through. Uh, some very important, one very important aspect is the size of that molecule. Okay, here we have uh, in this glass tube here, we have a membrane in the middle which uh, is impermeable to sugar. Okay, the uh, green molecules here are uh, sugar molecules which have been dissolved and they are simply too large to fit through the pores of the membrane. So in order to reach equilibrium, Instead of the sugar molecules moving and trying to uh, reach equilibrium, the water molecules will move. Okay, because the pores are small enough for the water to get through, 
uh, water will tend to move towards one side. In this case, it will move uh, towards the right to sort of lower the concentration on one side and raise the concentration on the left-hand side. Okay, and this, uh, this diffusion of water is simply called osmosis. Okay, people uh, tend to get somewhat confused about what osmosis is. Uh, it's very simply, it is just the diffusion of water across a membrane. Okay, and diffusion always goes uh, from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So in this case, we have on the initial setup on the left side of the tube, we have a high concentration of water. And on the right side of the tube, we have a lower concentration of water. So water is going to move from the left to the right. What about a cell? How can things move into a or out of a cell? Uh, so, well, there's two basic types of transport, uh, passive transport, shown here on the left, and uh, active transport. Okay, in passive transport, uh, the cell is not moving, not using any energy to move these molecules. Okay, and these molecules will always be moving uh, from an area of high to an area of low concentration. Okay, this is what's known as moving down the concentration gradient. Simple diffusion, uh, shown here with the, uh, the purple solutes. Uh, this is uh, for very, very small or, or uncharged molecules. Uh, these substances are able to kind of squeeze right in between the phospholipids of the membrane, and they can just move right into the cell through simple diffusion. Now, larger molecules or charged molecules can't fit through the membrane. And they can't enter into that hydrophobic middle part where all of the polar or the nonpolar uh, phospholipid tails are. So they get through through what's called uh, facilitated diffusion. Okay, and here you would have either a protein channel, uh, as shown for the uh, orange triangles there, or a carrier protein, as shown for the the blue circles there. And these uh, give a little channel or a, uh, a, a carrier, a way, a, a protein that allows these solutes to move through. But these are still passive. Okay? There is no energy put in. Even for the carrier protein, which does change shape, this does not require any energy. And we are still moving down the concentration gradient. Okay? In this case, it shows a high concentration outside the cell and the substances are moving in to where there is a lower concentration. But what about if a cell needs to uh, move things against the gradient. It needs to bring things in which are already in a high concentration or move things out which are, which are a very low concentration inside. In that case, uh, the cell uses what's called active transport. And this transport requires energy and it also requires uh, a protein pump. Okay, and this, is, uh, this pump changes shape, but this shape change requires the input of energy as shown here as ATP. So in this case, it uh, looks like we have the uh, orange diamonds here move, being moved into the cell where there is already a high concentration. Okay, so it's actively pulling these things in. And along with that, the uh, yellow circles there are being moved out. So uh, in terms of concentrations, there are three uh, kind of descriptions that are very important to remember uh, in terms of the relative concentrations. And these are hy hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. Okay, and these refer to the relative concentrations of solutes uh, inside or outside of the cell. So in a hypotonic solution, uh, that means that there, uh, there is less solute in the solution than there is inside the cell. So this cell will be placed in a hypotonic solution. If you, uh, for an animal cell, uh, shown here as a red blood cell, if you place those cells in a hypotonic solution, so you place cells in distilled water, uh, since the concentration of water is higher outside than it is inside, water would come rushing into the cell and cause the cell to burst or lice. A plant cell, though, uh, is perfectly fine and in a hypotonic solution. In fact, that is where plant cells want to be. Okay, they want water to be moving constantly in and having pressure 
on the outside. Uh, remember, the plant cells have a cell wall, so the cells can't really expand. They can't blow up and lice as the animal cells do. But this, this turgor pressure uh, pushes against the cell wall, and that is what causes plants, uh, or this is what enables plants to be able to stand up straight. Um, so the second solution here is an isotonic solution, and this means that the concentration is the same, exactly the same amount of dissolved salts inside and outside of the cell. And this is where animals like to be. Okay, they want to have an exact equilibrium in terms of water movement. Okay, the same amount of water moving in, same amount of water moving out. Okay, this is where animal cells are happy. But for a plant cell, this, is, this causes wilting. Okay, because now the cell has lost its pressure. It is now what we call flaccid, and this is what caused plants to wilt. Okay, and then the final solution here is what's called a hypertonic solution. And this is where the outside solution has a greater concentration of dissolved salts than the cytoplasm, than the inside of the cell. And uh, in both of these cases, this will cause water to leave the cell. And for a animal cell, this will cause the cell to shrivel up and die. Uh, in the case of a plant cell, uh, this leads to a state called plasmolysis. And this, what actually happens there is you can see the, the cell membrane actually pulls away from the cell wall. And this can cause the cells to die. All right, so let's talk about transport in plants. How do plants move uh, the solutes around the water and the sugar sap? Uh, one important concept that uh, pops up with plant transport is this, this idea of water uh, potential, which is given by the symbol psi. Okay? And water potential, uh, it's very simple to figure out, very simple to calculate. You just take uh, the two components, are a pressure component, which is psi p, and a solute component, which is psi s, and you add those together, and that gives the total water potential. And the use of water potential is a way to figure out which way is osmosis going to go. Okay, it will always go from an area of higher potential to an area of lower potential. So in this case, uh, again, we have our, our glass tube here. Uh, one side has pure water, which by definition has a water potential of zero. And on the other side, we have a 0.1 molar solution, which has a water potential, which has a pressure potential of zero because it is open to the atmosphere and a solute potential of negative 0.23. So we add those together, and the total water potential on the right-hand side there will be negative 0.23, so water will tend to move towards the right because that has the lower water potential. So in plants, there are a couple different uh, uh, vessel structures. Uh, there are the water-conducting cells, and these are called the xylem. Okay, and uh, Important to re remember with the xylem is that these cells are dead at maturity. Okay, they are just little, they really just function uh, as kind of like straws that go all up and down the length of the plant. And through adhesion, the water sticks to the sides, and through cohesion, the water is pulled up. And we'll, we'll talk a little, a little bit about the mechanism uh, in a minute. Uh, the sugar conducting cells that uh, move the sap around. Are, is called the phloem. Okay, and these cells are living. These cells actively are pumping sugar around. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the movement of sugar. Um, but first, going back to the movement of water. Uh, water enters the plant at the roots. Okay, the water moves in through the uh, root hairs and moves up into the, the xylem, which is kind of in the center, the, the xylem vessels there. But what's very important is that, so there's, there's two different pathways that the water can move through the cells. Uh, the apoplastic route, which is uh, the pink line here, and that is all through the adjacent cell walls. Okay, so this, uh, the apoplastic route does not cross through any membranes. And then there is the symplastic route, the uh, blue line here, and this is entering into the cells, uh, crossing at least one cell membrane. Now, if you remember, the cell membrane is what controls what gets in to the cells. So the plant does not want just to let anything into the, into the xylem that may be outside in the dissolved solutes. So there is this waxy strip here called the Casparian strip. 
that is uh, in these endodermal cells, which is this layer right before it hits the xylem. And this waxy barrier goes, with, goes throughout all of these cell walls and blocks this apoplastic route. And it forces all of the water to enter into the cell at this point. So it has to cross at least one cell membrane before it's allowed, before those solutes can get into the xylem. And this is where this allows the plant to control what gets in. Okay, it, this Casparian strip forces all of these dissolved solutes to pass through one cell membrane, and that way anything that could potentially be harmful that's dissolved in the, in the soil does not get into the xylem and is not moved all around the plant. Okay, so the water is uh, moved up a plant and the xylem movement is only one way, it only moves up and it's moved uh, through a mechanism called transpiration where and it's this pulling force. Okay, Up at the leaves uh, there are these uh, pores in the leaves called stomata and that is where the water leaves and as you can think of the water as a long uh, continuous chain all the way through the plant, and in this case all the way up the tree, from the leaves all the way down through the trunk into the roots and in, in, even into the soil. So as one water molecule leaves, this leaves through a stoma, it pulls on all the next water molecules because of the hydrogen bonds, because of the, the cohesive nature of water. And this pulling force is then transmitted all the way down the tree down into the roots, down into the soil, and it pulls water in to follow it. Okay, so this, this tr transpirative pull is the force that moves water up a tree or up any plant. Okay, and so that's very important. Where does the force come from to move these, to move these liquids? Uh, for water, the, it is a pulling force, and it comes from the uh, transpiration. For sugar... Okay, sugar can move either way. Sugar in the, in the phloem can move up or down. And the way you can figure out which way sugar will be moving is to remember that it always moves from source to sink. Okay, and the source is wherever that sugar is being made, and the sink is, for, is wherever that sugar is being used. Okay, in this case, uh, we have the sugar being made in the leaf through photosynthesis. And the sink is in a storage route where it will be converted into starch and stored for later use. So the movement of sugar is an active process by the plant. Okay, the sugar is pumped out of the mesophyll cells where it is made into the phloem tubes. And as the sugar is pumped in, that decreases the water potential. And water then moves in through osmosis uh, into the phloem from the adjacent xylem tubes. That causes pressure. Okay, the pressure increases in the phloem, and that is going to push the sap one way or the other. In this case, it's going to be pushing it down, because that uh, down towards the sink. And in the sink, the sucrose is actively pumped out of the phloem and into a cell of the root and that will increase the water potential as you decrease the concentration of sucrose and water will then flow out of the phloem into the back into the xylem and enter back into the, the xylem flow. Okay so sugar transport always moves from source to sink and it does so by this pressure flow mechanism. Water remember can only move up and that force comes from the pulling force. Okay, so what about animals? How do animals uh, move uh, fluids around? So the main fluid that animals need to move that we talked about was blood. And this uh, blood is of course used to carry nutrients and most importantly it's used to carry oxygen. So for animal circulatory systems there are two basic plans. Um, an open circulatory system, as seen in uh, arthropods, such as the grasshopper, um, and a closed circulatory system, seen in many other animals, such as the uh, earthworm here. Uh, so in an open circulatory system, 
that means that the circulating fluid, in this case uh, correctly termed hemolymph, uh, leaves the vessels and directly bathes all the organs. And uh, gas exchange occurs throughout the body and nutrient exchange. And then the fluid kind of flows back in and can be moved and can be pumped by the heart. You see here, the, uh, in the case of the grasshopper, there is this long uh, tubular heart which uh, moves all around uh, the, the, the dorsal surface there of the grasshopper. Uh, contrast that to the closed circulatory system in which the circulating fluid, in this case the blood, is always contained within the vessel. So there is a heart that uh, pumps the blood and that is what uh, gives the moving force for, for the blood and then it moves through the vessels. Um, gas exchange and nutrient exchange ha occurs in these capillary beds and then the blood stays in the vessels and then returns to the heart to be pumped again. In vertebrates, there are a few different circulatory uh, plans um, going from the very simple plan in the fish where this is a single circulation where the blood is pumped by the heart and it goes to the gills and the capillary bed in the gills is where a gas exchange occurs where the blood picks up the oxygen and then that oxygen rich, rich blood then moves to the body where it exchanges its oxygen for carbon dioxide and delivers that oxygen to all of, of the body organs and then that oxygen poor blood goes back to the heart. Okay, as organisms get larger, uh, this becomes a little bit inefficient because for each pump of the heart, the blood has to go get through two capillary beds and the capillary beds slow the velocity of the blood down greatly. So in order to compensate for that, circulatory systems have gotten a little bit more complex. Uh, in the amphibians, uh, there is this second uh, circulation that goes that carries blood first to the lungs and also to the skin where a gas exchange occurs. And then that oxygen rich blood comes back to the heart and gets a second pump before going back out to the body to exchange that oxygen. But the problem with uh, amphibians is that there's only this one, one ventricle. Uh, so the oxygen poor and the oxygen rich blood can sort of mix. So you, there is never completely oxygenated blood moving out through the body. Okay? And the same thing sort of happens in reptiles, except for birds, uh, where there is this three-chambered heart. So there, is, uh, there are two pumps before the blood uh, for the blood to get through the two capillary beds, but there is this mixing of the oxygen poor and the oxygen rich blood. Uh, mammals and birds, which have the complete four chambered heart, do not have this mixing problem. Okay, there are two ventricles uh, which are completely separate and keep the oxygen poor blood on the right side and the oxygen rich blood on the left hand side. So the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs where it picks up the oxygen and then it comes back to the heart in the left side and the left side pumps the blood out to the body where that oxygen is delivered to all of the body organs. And then that oxygen poor blood then returns back to the right side. Okay. And this, uh, the pathway of blood, um, probably good to review this. I don't think you're going to need to know all the names of all of the uh, vessels. Uh, but I certainly know the names of the, the chambers. Uh, the larger chambers are the right ventricle and the left ventricle there on the bottom, uh, numbers 1 and 5. And then the, uh, the smaller chambers, numbers 11 and 4, are the atria, the right atrium and the left atrium. Okay, so the ventricles are what uh, supply the pumping force. Okay, the right ventricle pumps the oxygen-poor blood out to the lungs where it picks up the oxygen. That oxygen-rich blood then returns back to the left side and the left ventricle pumps that blood out to the body where the oxygen is delivered and then the oxygen-poor blood is then returned back to the right side of the heart. And that blood is of course carried in the vessels. Um, arteries carry blood away from the heart 
Um, they tend to be a little bit thicker uh, because the blood is under uh, higher pressure because it's coming right out of the heart. Then the blood goes through the capillary beds and capillaries are very, very thin, lots of branches to increase the surface area. And that is where the uh, gas exchange occurs. And then after the capillary bed, uh, the blood will all drain into the veins and veins bring blood back to the heart. Uh, they tend to have a little bit thinner walls um, and the veins can also have valves in them. And those valves are there to maintain uh, the blood flow in one direction, okay, so that the blood will only flow back towards the heart and will not kind of pool, at, especially in, uh, in the legs. So um, gas exchange. Uh, gas exchange is mediated again by the concentration gradient, as I talked about earlier when we talked about the uh, cellular aspects of transport. Uh, Air that is inhaled into the lungs has a high concentration of oxygen. Blood that's coming in has a very low concentration of oxygen. So oxygen will diffuse into the blood in the lungs. And then when that blood gets to the body, uh, to the tissues, the tissues have a lower concentration of oxygen. So the oxygen will diffuse out. Okay, so it's all due to these, uh, the concentration gradient. And the same thing occurs with carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide in the tissues is high and it's low in the blood. So it tends to, to diffuse out of the tissues into the blood. And then when that blood gets to the lungs, the concentration in the blood is higher than in the lungs, in the, than in the air in the lungs. So the CO2 will, will dissolve, will diffuse out and we can exhale it. Okay, it's not, terribly important that you know all these numbers or the exact mechanism for how these gases are transported, but knowing that it moves uh, due to the concentration gradients, I think, is uh, quite important. All right, and the last thing uh, that we covered in Unit 2 was osmoregulation. Okay, how do animals regulate the amount of dissolved salts in their body bodily fluids, mainly blood? Uh, and the main waste product uh, that we need, that animals need to get rid of is the nitrogen. Okay, how do we get rid of all this nitrogen that comes from uh, breaking down of proteins or of nucleic acids? And there's a few different ways that animals can excrete their excess nitrogen. Uh, the simplest way is just converting it into ammonia. And the problem with that is ammonia is very toxic. So the only animals that really secrete uh, nitrogen waste as ammonia are animals that, which live in an aquatic en environment because they can release the am ammonia immediately and have it diluted with all of the water. Okay, so most of the fish, uh, fishes will excrete uh, ammonia. Um, birds and other re reptiles uh, will convert their nitrogen waste into a chemical called uric acid. And the major advantage of secreting uh, uric acid is that it is water insoluble. So they can get very, very high concentrations and kind of form this paste uh, with it. If you've ever, you know, come across uh, bird droppings on your car, uh, you'll know that it, it is pretty nasty. Um, and that the, this allows these reptiles to conserve water because the uric acid can be excreted in such a high concentration. Okay, um, mammals and amphibians and a few uh, fish species will convert their nitrogen waste into this into a molecule called ure urea. Okay, and urea is nice because it's very water soluble, so uh, uh, we can get rid of it, um, and it's not toxic. Okay, not toxic as ammonia. So um, the AP test writers tend to really like uh, a couple of these different um, filtering systems, uh, such as this one in the planarian, in the flatworm. Uh, and they have these uh, structures called flame bulbs, which run all throughout the body, and the uh, fluid moves through, and the flame bulb uh, filters out the waste products and then moves it into these tubes, uh, the tubule cells, 
and uh, then they go out the uh, out these openings in, in the body walls called nephridiopores. Okay. Um, every now and then you you might see a mention of these uh, meta metanephridium, and these are found in earthworms. Okay. Every segment here has these uh, collecting tubes, which are surrounded by this capillary network. And these work uh, very similar to, to the flame bulbs. Uh, waste products are moved out into the collecting tubes, and then they can be uh, excreted from the body through the nephridiopores. And uh, one more that the uh, again that the AP test writers really seem to like are uh, in insects. Uh, they have these uh, Malpighian tubules, and these are just kind of again they're just sort of extensions out into the interstitial fluids. Remember, uh, insects have that open circulatory system. So the hemolymph is just moving all around here. And these Malpighian tubules, uh, diffuse, uh, the waste products are diffused into the Malpighian tubules, and then it's moved into uh, the digestive tract and uh, combined with the, the feces and removed from the body. What I think is the most important excretory system is that found in vertebrates or in humans, and that is the kidney. Uh, paired organs found sort of in the, uh, the back of the abdominal cavity. Uh, looking at the overall anatomy of a kidney, there is the medulla, which is sort of in the middle, and the cortex, which is on the outside. Um, and they all connect into this large kind of central channel called the renal pelvis, and that leads out to the ureter, and each ureter then uh, leads down into the bladder, and the bladder holds the urine uh, until it can be emptied. Um, the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron, okay, and the nephron uh, begins at a structure called the glomerulus, which is a large ball of capillaries, um, and it is surrounded by Bowman's capsule, which is the beginning of the tube. At that point, that is where filtration occurs, and then the rest of the nephron uh, is involved in modification of that filtrate and turning it into urine. So if we look at what exactly is happening at each of these places, uh, the initial filtrate right there at Bowman's capsule, right at the glomerulus, that filter, that filtrate, is simply based on size. So anything that is smaller than a cell is going to be removed from the blood plasma at that point. So if you took a sample of that filtrate, it would look exactly like blood plasma, which is blood just minus the cells. The rest of what happens in the proximal tubule, uh, in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, in the ascending limb of the loop of Hemley, in the distal tubule, in the collecting duct, that is just simply modifications of that initial filtrate and turning it in finally into urine at the end. So I don't think it's, very, it's terribly important that you know exactly what happens where, um, but just know that the, that the fil that initial filtrate is highly modified. Okay? Some things are taken out. Uh, nutrients are recovered. Uh, salts can be recovered if they're needed. Uh, water can be recovered if uh, you need to get more water. Um, things can be added. Ammonia compounds can be added. The urea can be added in, into the filtrate. And this happens all along this, uh, the, the, the tubule here. Um, and different parts of the tubule do different aspects. Again, I don't think it's terribly important, um, but at the end, when urine is produced at the very end here, uh, it will be hyperosmotic to the blood plasma, meaning that the concentration of these solutes will be higher. And that's because all along the way here, water can be removed. So this allows uh, vertebrates and mammals to conserve their water. Okay, which is very important for land animals. Okay, so again, it's not terribly important that you know what is taken out where or what is added where or whether it's active transport or passive transport. Just remember 
that the initial filtrate looks just like blood plasma and then it is highly modified before it gets to the end in which at which point it is now urine and is hyperosmotic. Okay, so that is the transport review. Um, cellular transport based on the membrane and then how do plants move things around, uh, water and sugar, and then uh, animal circulation and animal osmoregulation. Dropping science like Galileo dropped the orange.